Okay, thank you so much for everybody who's joined us so far. Uh, my name is Jamie Grimm. I am a researcher with the Wildlife Conservation Society Canada and uh, the KBA program, so I'll be facilitating our meeting today. I would like to acknowledge that the land that I live and work on is uh, part of the traditional territories of many Indigenous groups and First Nations, um, in particular the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wandat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. So we are recording this webinar, and it will be recorded, uh, it will be posted online rather with all of the other webinars that we've had so far in this series, uh, which are five other recordings that are available. We do ask that throughout this webinar, you post any questions you might have using the chat function, and we will get to all of those questions hopefully at the very end of the presentation. So I would like to introduce our speaker today, who we're very grateful to have with us, uh, Dr. Justina Ray. Uh, Justina is the president and senior scientist at WCS Canada, as well as being an advisor to the KBA Canada program. And today, Justine is going to be talking about the National KBA Standard um, on which she is a co-author. And so with that, I'll pass it over to you, Justina. Terrific. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Hold on one sec. And hopefully that works. Yep, and thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jamie, also for the land acknowledgement. Uh, you and I are in the same general area, and uh, although we haven't seen each other for, for a year, um, should, we should usually are, are in the same office. So, um, but thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, so my task here today is to introduce you to this national standard for the identification of KBAs in Canada. Um, and it, this is a, a new thing for us. Um, uh, you know, we're just, uh, you know, putting it on the world, on the on the uh, web today uh, or the other day, and 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 uh, talking about it publicly, really for the first time. Although it's a body of work that we've been uh, advancing for quite some time, ever since we launched the KBA initiative in Canada a few years ago. This is, of course, also based on the global standard, and I will be talking about that. So in short, I am uh, representing the work of many people here, um, and, uh, and, and, and you'll see how that, how that works as this unfolds. Um, the importance of identifying key sites for biodiversity has been recognized for decades, starting with the, inter, uh, with the important bird area approach that many of us are, are very familiar with in Canada that was started by Birth, BirdLife International. And more than 12,000 IBAs have been identified globally, several hundred in Canada over the last 40 years. And uh, the success of IBAs did lead to similar other approaches for other taxonomic groups, but it became a bit of a cacophony. Uh, many different uh, types of ways of sort of identifying areas that were important for biodiversity emerged uh, over the last several decades. And as such, uh, in 2004, the IUCN at, a, at one of its meetings uh, really um, stressed the importance of, of having a unifying framework for, for identifying important sites that consider biodiversity comprehensively. So not just for individual taxa here and there that people cannot keep track of, but for all um, uh, you know, elements of biodiversity. And this was recognized formally by members of the IUCN in a particular motion, this resolution of WCC 3.013 led to the creation of a task force, uh, a joint task force with uh, both uh, the WPCA and the um, Species Survival Commission, which led a, a, a consultative process to develop the KBA standard. And Stephen Woodley uh, from Canada was one of the co-chairs of this throughout the process. Um, and, and we had our eye on Canada fairly soon. So without going into any details, this is kind of just to let you know that the process and the standard was developed through this really extensive uh, consultation over four years that involved numerous technical and regional workshops, a parallel, cons parallel consultation of end users, two rounds of online consultation, 
and it was formally adopted by the IUCN Council in April of 2016 and then unveiled um, at the end of the year in Hawaii at a meeting. And that was actually the first time that um, you know, more Canadians were became aware of the standard because this was all developed uh, uh, mostly outside, uh, you know, internationally. And although there was obviously um, engagement uh, in Canada with this, it was pretty minimal. And it wasn't until the end of, of that year that really people became much more aware of it. And indeed, that was also, uh, you know, immediately, uh, you know, there was lots of applicability for Canada. And before I get into that uh, too much, I, just to, to introduce you a bit to the standard, and you've seen it a little bit for those of you who have been uh, engaged in the in the webinars of, of late, that you know the standard is is composed of five criteria, and it looks uh, very much similar in structure to the red list, which I'll be talking about a bit, and you know something that's familiar to us also in Canada as we've applied it here, and uh, the these. Uh, these criteria were developed thinking about all the other kinds of standards that had emerged over the years um, and looking at criteria that would be important for, for, bio, for, for signaling biodiversity, but at the same time um, that could be applicable to all taxa. Um, and so, you know, you have some uh, criteria that are uh, well, uh, well, you know, that are intuitive, for example, uh, you know, that were based on uh, globally threatened taxa, others that are much more restricted, um, where biological processes would take place. So this identifies sites where, you know, a good proportion of, of, the, of a certain population or the, the global range of a species occurs or where there are quite a few uh, endemic species or just one endemic species where a significant portion of the range occurs. Um, and biological processes, for example, um, you know, breeding or, or other types of life processes, even evolutionary processes. And then also a, a criteria that celebrates ecological integrity. So not just looking uh, at it from a hot spot perspective, but also um, looking at uh, sites that are necessarily much larger, but where you've got still intact species assemblages and ecological processes. There's also a quantitative criterion um, and it, it's in its early stages of development. Now, uh, certain aspects of uh, KBAs uh, need to be, you know, we need to be aware of that right, at, right from the get-go. I mean, we understand uh, we understand the definition, but they're imagined in the standard to be identified by national constituencies. And, and while they're using globally standardized criteria and quantitative thresholds, they would be applied to the geography of the country. And as such, you know, national coordination groups are emerging all around the world. Canada is, was one of the first ones, one of the most mature ones, but we do have, uh, you know, uh, NDCs, national coordination sorry, an NCGs, National Coordination Groups, emerging uh, across Africa, Mozambique, South Africa, Australia, uh, uh, increasingly in Asia, um, uh, the Mediterranean, even, even um, uh, the Middle East, and then uh, South America as well. And this is, you know, there's more and more interest galvanizing. It is a big task for a country to take this on. You need to do this in a coordinated way. And, and we were committed to doing that from the start. The criteria, as I've mentioned, are applicable across all taxonomic groups to terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environments. And it was deliberately constructed to be that way. And, um, you know, one part that it's not necessarily a criterion, but a particular uh, stage in the process is the delineation. Because unlike, you know, the red list where your, your uh, you know, your, your assessment of, of the um, the list uh, of a species is, is basically snaps to the boundary or the range of that species. And so that does not need to be deliberated. In this case, we're talking about particular sites. And so understanding that delineation and how that happens is actually quite a complex process and uh, something that's taken a lot of thought. Now, um, at the same time as, uh, you know, KBAs were emerging, you know, we also had the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Aichi targets, and particularly Target 11, which everybody is uh, aware of by this point. And in fact, we're, we've moved on, and, and you know, I'll, I'll make that point in a second, but uh, 
right from that start, I mean, if you look at the actually how the target 11 is, is articulated, even though the 17% or the 10% for marine areas gets the most attention in oxygen, it says right there in, in the target that, you know, uh, areas of particular importance of biodiversity need to be safeguarded in particular. Um, and that's where KBAs and, and other aspect, uh, things can fit into that. Um, you know, Canada has taken that seriously. Uh, the, the target 11 is, is made, has been made into target one. And then in, in uh, 2017, right, um, you know, the pathway to target one was uh, constructed specifically as a, uh, a, a process led by, um, you know, across the, uh, of, across all provinces and, and territories and, and, the, and uh, nationally as well. Uh, as as uh, you know, a, a particular process to uh, get close to the 17 percent, and 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 that is uh, is is emerging. Um, you know, it, it's coming t uh, close to its end, and then also uh, then the you know how this will occur in the next iteration uh, is 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 we're going to hear about soon. With respect to the National Advisory Panel that was struck as part of the pathway to target one, they have a particular recommendation in their important report uh, that all jurisdictions in Canada apply the, the, uh, the global IUCN KBA standard to identify these areas of importance for biodiversity. There's also another mention that it would be also good to do so nationally. The timeline in Canada is worth noting uh, just because you know you can see where we are in the process now in 2021 with the launch of the KBA national standard. And at the beginning was the IUCN launch of the KBA global standard. Uh, as I said, immediately the, the uh, and coincidentally, the, the, the pathway to target one was launched with a sub theme looking at areas of importance for biodiversity. And it was at that point where we were able to start uh, looking at this in an integrated fashion, bringing in the notion of KBAs, which uh, provided a lot of interest across the country in, in various fora. Uh, which which we you know convened and or were invited to in in 2018 planning what uh, the NCG might look like ultimately and then we were prepared to launch in early 2019 one of the the, the best uh, events was to bring on uh, the KBA uh, coordinator Kira Rautsep who is uh, leads the KBA identification process and uh, the secretariat uh, that uh, which WCS leads. And then we also seeded uh, financing and core partnership between WCS Canada, Birds Canada, and NatureServe Canada, the latter two who are in charge of the databases and are part of uh, the, the management structure. You know, in 2020, we launched more officially. That's when people started understanding what this is a little bit more. And then really we've been focusing most uh, intently on the identification process through 2020 and now. And uh, and during all of this time, launching, uh, uh, you know, putting together the the KBA stand national standard of which this is, um, you know, what which we're targeting um, our conversation today. The structure that we've put together, if you look on the left, uh, that's the global KBA program that's uh, you know housed, uh, where the secretariat is as as uh, Bird Life International and IUCN together housed in uh, in. Uh, uh, Cambridge mostly, although that doesn't matter today, um, and and in charge of of also uh, you know the, the main locus for the the the, the central KBA database base, the world database, but also other national coordination groups will dock to this uh, area. This will be where um, uh, approval and review of of KBAs that meet the global standard will are occurring. And there's also a formal standards and appeals committee as well. The structure that we've set up in Canada is also involved with a with a, a body of uh, that uh, like the coalition, which is a loose set of organizations that have signed on and of interest. Um, but out of that arises a, a management committee that really takes care more of the day to day and uh, leads um, leads many decision makings and and works. Uh, and, and convenes at least once a month. The secretariat, as I said, is led by WCS Canada, 
And then also uh, Birds Canada um, and NatureServe have the KBA databases. We regard the broader Canadian KBA community as um, a, a large um, and amorphous set of, uh, of users, which we hope will grow grow as, as, as more and more people understand what, what KBAs are and how they might be used. And this will be taking place over a few years of intensive in identification. Um, when the criteria were set up, and this is a little bit of a deeper dive into the criteria and the sub criteria, it was deliberate that they would look at, at the the three level or take care of the three levels of of um, or the three elements, uh, uh, broader elements of biodiversity, genetic diversity, species, and ecosystems. So this is while many of the criteria are focused on species, we have a number that are uh, focused on ecosystems as well. Uh, including threatened ones, endemic ones, and so on, very relevant for Canada. And then a few that also take into account genetic diversity. How KBAs fit into the conservation landscape. Um, they are a, a complementary layer of biodiversity knowledge to enhance decision making. But, you know, although the conversation that we've been having so far in this webinar has been mostly about protected areas, there are so many more um, ways in which KBAs will be useful or envisioned. And in fact, I, I mentioned uh, the end user surveys that were done as part of the global process. And that was confirmed through many, many groups from, uh, you know, funding, funding bodies to uh, uh, to uh, you know corporations, industry associations, um, but also you know it'll be interesting and important for land use planning, environmental assessments, any kind of uh, private land stewardship and acquisition, and then informing investments in nature. It is very important to stress that there's no management of prescription uh, that comes with uh, these KBA sites. That they're identified, they're mapped. Uh, and, and all information about that identification is, is part and parcel of, of the site and, and so on. But, you know, the, there is no, they're agnostic to how they will be used, um, even though, you know, they're, you know, the, the, the notion of safeguarding them is obviously inherent in the idea that we need to know where areas are important for biodiversity. KBAs are really a building block to fit into conservation planning, um, and uh, they're not a prioritization um, mechanism per se. The strengths of the tools and approach that we've uh, imagined and, and that has been implemented as, it, as it's been implemented uh, both globally and in, and in Canada is that it, it allows for kind of a rigorous process to, to be and one that can be consistent because you if you've got these standard criteria that are quantitative that have been tested and reviewed um, you know, then uh, and, and and apply to various taxa. Then, um, then that 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 is 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 really much more um, uh, that that is better than having something qualitative that's that's uh, that really subjective and and so on. It's not another single species approach, but it really is a broad biodiversity approach that includes multiple species and and ecosystems. It comes with it, um, it demands a good documentation of process and data. And in fact, during the course of, of the identification process, we've amalgamated so much data and expertise through just the process of identification that we are at the same time in an un unanticipated fashion, at least at the outset, uh, uh, figuring out ways in which to make those data that have gone into the identification process more broadly available to the Canadian public, to users, and so on. And, and, and so that's going to be part of what we unveil eventually. Uh, bringing together and building on the Canada-wide network of, of science experts and, and knowledge holders has been a, a great process so far. And this is a scalable uh, kind of process and standard. I should um, you know, emphasize that the Global KBA standard is still very new. You know, 2016 is 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 not very long ago. By by contrast, the uh, the the global IUCN Red List standard was uh, brought uh, in uh, 50 years ago and has lot lots and lots of years of of implementation. Uh, the guidelines we already have uh, a. a a, a version 1.1 guidelines. These are 100 plus pages long because these have lots of information on how um, the standard is to be implemented, what are the definitions of various terms, um, what is the common practice, uh, what are some pitfalls and, and uh, tips for, for being able to implement the standard. 
Um, and, and that happens with experience. And of course, you know, there will be adjustments along the way. We anticipate that in a few years, the standard itself, similar to the IUCN Red List standard, will need to be uh, tweaked um, with based on experience. Um, and, you know, but right now it's early days, but lots of guidelines uh, that have been developed. The national standard itself is comes from an interest in, you know, with Canada being the second largest country in the world, that this being a very important to honor the biodiversity that's particular to Canada in the sense that, you know, some, we have many species that are going to be very important to Canada, but not necessarily land on the global uh, red list or, or be recognized in, in that fashion. Um, and um, and that, you know, this is a, a chance to really also develop a standard that's particular to Canada, looks at various ways in which uh, the, the, the guidelines would be tailored to the Canadian context. And it's, so, it's for this reason that we uh, wanted to develop the, the, the national standard very early on, that this was something that was of interest to us from, from the first day. We did engage in a fairly significantly long process also because we had to garner enough experience with the identification itself. And then once we were ready in the fall and, 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 and actually a, a year before that with preliminary versions, we asked for reviews and received excellent reviews um, by federal, provincial and territorial government agency uh, representatives, uh, scientists and managers uh, that were participating in the Pathway to Canada Target 1 process. And that was very useful to be able to dock onto that process, to be able to use the people assembled who were thinking about these kind of issues first and foremost, and also from a practical standpoint, and it was very valuable. In addition to that, uh, we had uh, at least 18 peer reviewers along the way that, that, that looked at this, um, including some from the global uh, community. And then we formally approved, um, the this, this standard was formally approved by the uh, KBA Canada Nas uh, Management Committee last month. Um, and it will be also translate, it has been translated into French. Um, it's drafted right now, so we're, we're preparing that. Um, this version is on the web. I'll give you the address at the end, and the French version will come pretty soon. Just a little bit of a look through the table of contents, as, as boring as that could, could look like from a slide perspective, it is useful to sort of see and look inside the covers to see what kind of things and topics that we've been covering. Um, first, is there a bit of an introduction similar to what I have given you so that, um, you know, also understanding why, um, you know, Canada is, 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 is used to and has already had a precedent for adopting a, nas adapting a, nas a global standard to the national context, and I'll go into that in a second. But, um, but also uh, just sort of what uh, the process would be for identifying what the distinction between global and national KBAs, and then uh, really looking at actual the criteria and, and how, they're how, the thresh how they will be adapted. Um, and we'll get into that in a second as well. We did bring in other considerations that were specific to the Canadian context and also a little bit of information about the process as it's looking so that we could have it all available in one, in one standard and then some definitions and terms. Um, the KBA criteria themselves are displayed, also comparing against uh, the global thresholds. Uh, we have a quantitative, a comparative summary of, of these. Uh, and then also a bit of a deep dive into the delineation procedures, because those are very important, both practical considerations, but also really understanding how uh, these would occur, both with also with local and uh, uh, knowledge and, 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 and uh, people on the ground, which is absolutely critical. Um, and then a bit of an annex of, uh, with additional specifications uh, that just give a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the concepts that we uh, look into, into the actual, uh, into, into, in the body of the document. There is a great precedent in Canada for adapting a global standard. And this is, uh, you know, most of us know what COSIWIC is, uh, that's been, uh, that is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, that's mandated in, in the Species at Risk Act to assess scientifically species at risk. And uh, the, the criteria that are used are adapted, na there are na is a national adaptation of the IUCN Red List, which is global. So the IUCN Red List standard is global, but those 
uh, that uh, standard has been adapted and Canadianized, and that's what COSIWIC uses today, um, and and refers very consistently to the global guidelines for you know particular definitions and so on. So there's consistency across the board, but it is snapped to Canada in particular. And you know, the, uh, there's also precedent uh, by COSIWIC for applying taxonomic expertise and in indigenous knowledge to criteria. And you know, the way that uh, COSIWIC is structured uh, honors this sort of taxonomic diversity. Um, it is. It does not deal with ecosystems, but at least on a, a species level, it really does deal with species and genetic diversity within. Um, and and you've got a whole host of uh, you know individuals who are involved in the assessment process. You've got the people around the Kosiwik table directly who have represent enormous taxonomic and geographic expertise. But you've also got that embedded within the subcommittees who don't necessarily are at the table, but they work behind the scenes over the years. Uh, to get the reports and assessments ready for um, for the COSIWIC table to do the formal assessments. And that kind of structure, because I personally had been involved in that for nine years, uh, made it very easy for me to conceive of how the KBA global standard could be adapted here. And so it's worthwhile reminding our, ourselves of our Canadian experience, which is quite unique in the world in this regard. And for those of you who are familiar with the COSIWIC assessments um, and, and standard, and without going into any details, it's constructed, you know, similarly because it's from the red list. And you've got, you know, uh, thresholds uh, that, uh, that are used uh, with each of the criteria that look very familiar. And in, with, in most cases, you can basically use the same criteria and even thresholds to apply to the Canadian geography. So, you know, instead of evaluating from a global scale, you're evaluating as to Canada. And that's how it's been working very well for quite a number of years. Uh, the national KBA standard has a number of distinguishing features and uh, this table, this sort of figure kind of gives you a sense of what kind of specificities, uh, you know, we would have bet between global and national KBAs. And um, some of them are quite obvious. I mean, you know, uh, obviously the, the difference between a global and, and a national KBA is that one is nationally uh, identifying sites that's significant for the national persistence, whereas the other is the global. Um, and 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 so this this is uh, you know probably pretty obvious for most people. What's really uh, useful about having national KBAs is that we can get away from some of the more stringent um, uh, taxonomic. Uh, adherence to the red, the IUCN red list that we do not um, that we do not use necessarily in Canada for for a number of reasons. Not all uh, uh, you know endemic species or or even globally threatened species are on that occur in Canada are on the IUCN red list. Some of that is explained because we have some of our own uh, processes. We have uh, you know legislation both in uh, Canada and the U.S. that that uh, where assessments uh, directly um, uh, directly adhere to. So uh, that is more the place of focus rather than than the red list itself in terms of being a, being able to be listed. But uh, but there are other reasons as well. So um, we also have uh, the nature serve um, global ranking system. And that has been able to assess more species than COSIWIC has been able to, or the IUCN Red List, and recognizes more species as being at risk, um, and, uh, and particularly ones at the national scale. So the ranking systems can be used with national KBAs, and they can't necessarily with global KBAs. And so that's another use of the KBA standard, because we can honor those, those um, uh, ranking systems that have been able to do more of the work uh, in terms of uh, uh, assessing more of the breadth of, of Canadian biodiversity than than the IUCN or COSIWIC uh, processes alone, which are which are much more involved. So the outcomes uh, that we're seeking by having a national KBA standard. Uh, you know, increases the relevance of the KBA designation to Canada. We would have both national and in, uh, global KBAs. The global KBAs will be housed in the world database, but the database that's emerging that will be led by Birds Canada here, an adaptation of the IBA database, the important bird area database that's in production as we speak, 
uh, would have both national and uh, global KBAs. This provides information about the taxonomic units that are accepted in Canada. Um, it supports existing monitoring frameworks and, and biodiversity initiatives. Um, and uh, it captures biodiversity elements that might be at risk here, that we consider at risk but not be globally threatened. And, uh, and those with widespread geographic distributions, uh, particularly those that are at the edge of their range in Canada. And those edge of range species are often in biodiversity hotspots in Canada. So that's another uh, tool for being able to signal that. Just a bit of an illustration of sort of how much more breadth uh, you will get with uh, national criterion uh, versus global. Um, and, and another, uh, uh, which, you know, in all, across all uh, species. So uh, you'll have, you have about 60, you have about 700 species recognized globally through the, the global process, but quite a few more. Uh, including designatable units, which I'll get into in a second, that would be embraced by the national standard or identified as such. And uh, what's really important about uh, designatable units is uh, that the Species Risk Act includes quite, you know, it, uh, there's a quote in the Species at Risk Act that, that includes subspecies varieties or geographically or genetically distinct population as its definition of wildlife species. So the definition inherently recognizes diversity below the species level. And, um, and it also recognizes that the conservation of biological diversity requires protection for those kinds of taxonomic entities. And this gave rise to the designatable unit concept, which was, uh, you know, the term was, uh, is Kosiewicz's term, but that is based on its interpretation of SARA. And these are spatially and ecologically or genetically discrete and evolutionarily significant units that are irreplaceable components of biodiversity. And I put on, um, you know, a, a, a map of, of the 11 extant designatable units that are recognized for caribou in honor of significant evolutionary and, uh, and ecologically, uh, ecological diversity in, that's displayed in the country for that species alone. Um, if you just, a, I'm not going to go into details here, of course, but just giving you into a bit of a look into one of the criterion of threatened uh, biodiversity, that this is what this, the national standard would look like. It will have it by side by side, the global KBA versus the national KBA, and particularly the taxonomic entities uh, make it really, uh, you know, are, are quite distinct. But the thresholds are going to, are the same, but just applied to Canada versus the globe. Um, and, and we're having this pre presentation comparison of global versus national in the same, uh, on, in these tables in there um, for all of the criteria. We also provide additional tailored guidance for the Canadian context, which I've alluded to already. And uh, these considerations are like, uh, you know, the, the issues related to data quality, types of knowledge and expert input, uh, what we do with uncertainty, uh, the standards of documentation, uh, reevaluation, and, and climate considerations. Um, and uh, we have definitions and terms and delineation procedures in Canada as well, which are quite thought through, also taught, um, uh, worked in, in conjunction with, uh, with members of the pathway, the National Steering Committee as well, and, and also a, a Canadian review process that dovetails with the, the one that is global. We have a complicated workflow model. Do not worry about any of the details here. It's a, this is a sort of a general outline of the process. Uh, biodiversity and expert input is at the nexus, um, including local and traditional knowledge. They're integral to all steps of the process. And once a biodiversity element and candidate site are identified, we use the best available data to calculate whether the site meets the quantitative thresholds required to qualify under one or more criteria. The site boundaries are then delineated based on ecological data. There is no minimum or maximum size. Um, and next, a proposal will be created. They will be ground truth uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the local areas, um, reviewed uh, through a fairly significant process. And then next, a proposal is created using a standardized template, which then undergoes another external review process. So once a KBA is reviewed and accepted by the Canadian or the global secretariat, depending on uh, which, um, which level it is, it is published in an, it will be published in an open source database. And so we're in the process of all of that as we speak. 
I welcome you to visit the kbacanada.org website. This is where all of our documents, process and so forth, uh, who's involved and, and all that is, is, is being, where these, these webinars and so on are, are being posted as they, as they emerge. Uh, this national standard is being posted, it is already there under resources. If you look under the key documents um, drop down menu under resources, you'll find it. Here is the actual uh, um, uh, web address, but it'll be easy to, for you to find either way, and uh, and and we'll make and that'll be immediately available. Before we take questions, I just want to thank uh, many many people listed here and many others involved in the KBA identification process. I also want to thank the leadership of Kira Routsapern and her team. Uh, for pulling this together. Many of our advisors like Maria Lung and uh, David Frazier, uh, Stephen Woodley, and then uh, those, and then uh, Courtney and uh, Courtney Robertson and, and, and Zuzu Gadala, who've been extraordinary uh, liaisons to the National Steering Committee. And thank you to Grant Hogg and Anthony Danks for their leadership there, as well as our partners and everybody else. So I'll pause there um, and take questions. And I'd also like to invite Kira because we'll be taking these questions together and uh, very much appreciate your attention. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Justina. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I will remind everybody that you can please put any questions you have in the chat box. Uh, there is also a raise hand function. If you would prefer to ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand and then I'll allow you to unmute. Um, so I'll start us off, Justina. How will national versus global KBAs be treated in the conservation landscape in Canada, do you think? Uh, will they be uh, viewed differently when we're doing conservation planning or considering meeting our biodiversity targets? Yeah, I mean, a KBA is a KBA. I mean, in the it will be displayed in the in the database and the registry ultimately as a KBA. But you can go. There are many ways in which you can find out all sorts of information about KBAs, and you can you can catalog them either way, right? Uh, uh, you can depict them as national or or global ones, or or for the various taxonomic um, entities that they've been uh, that that have led to their identification or the criteria. Uh, those kinds of information will be documented uh, within um, within a site. You know, once you get to get to the registry, so it's really m mostly up to the user about how uh, that individual would be able to use it. But uh, we we do not attach any more importance to a national versus a global KBA um, because uh, there are sites uh, that are important for biodiversity for different reasons. I don't know, uh, Kira, if you have anything to add to that. No, I think that covers it. I think that's great. We we hope that the I mean, there's there's so little biodiversity left that these are these are sites that are just integral to Canadian biodiversity and global biodiversity. Great. Uh, we have a question from Liam asking with regards to uh, criterion E, has any consideration been given to designating old growth as statistically irreplaceable? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a very good question, um, and the criterion E, um, which which would have to emerge from uh, system systematic conservation planning, uh, would could be applied in a variety of ways. Um, and in that in that case, you would imagine that old growth would would come up uh, in particular areas. Um, there are other ways, though, that old growth is emerging. Uh, based on uh, just site the, what they have in their sites that that that, that work with other criteria, uh, and and as well as ecological integrity is also encapsulates quite a bit of old growth as well is what we're finding. So um, I, we may not actually need a criterion E uh, for that much. Uh, in, in fact, we're doing the other criteria first before we sort of see how criterion E, which is a little bit later in its evolution, could possibly be applied in this context. Barb asks, how are consumptive uses of wildlife dealt with? So for example, hunting, trapping, and calls by governments. Uh, so, so um, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not particularly relevant to the very, the, the most of the criteria. So those are really, the, it's the actual 
uh, species situation that dictate uh, based on 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 uh, the parameters that I showed before. Uh, you know, in, in particular, the percentage of the range or 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 such features that would dictate whether whether a site is occurring. The only place that I can think of off the bat that it might have some bearing on ecological integrity, because although you might uh, uh, you know uh, scope a, a site or an area that would be potential for Criterion C ecological integrity site, if there has been significant uh, take of organisms in that area, that mean that that it's affected uh, the the ecological integrity of, of of the population. I mean, it, 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 sorry, that it's affected the integrity of the populations in some fashion. That that would be uh, come into sort of more local ground truthing and and so on, right? Um, and you you know that is a, a situation in in other parts of the world that that have been identified. That there you might have uh, beautiful land cover and lots of um, uh, very little industrial uh, uh, activity in an area, but the forest would be empty because uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, of, of exploitation of, of organisms in there. And so uh, that would then not qualify probably for a Criterion C site. I would, I would just also highlight one last thing, which just in case it was getting at this kind of thing, was that the uh, identification of all of these sites um, as Justine has mentioned, has absolutely zero impact on management within the site. That that those kinds of decisions, for example, if there's a policy to reduce hunting or or regulate um, these kinds of activities within a KBA, that's that's not uh, what the KBA project is about. That that would be up to local decision makers to decide on those kinds of things, um, that the KBA identification process um, is really just to identify which are the sites of importance and doesn't have an impact on access to land or these kinds of practices. Thank you both. Uh, Graham is wondering what the level of buy-in is from the provinces so far. Well, uh, the provinces have been the provinces and territories have been fantastic on the national steering committee, um, and as I said, in, uh, expressed a, a significant amount of interest, um, and and have been and many staff have been involved in in certain among the, the processes. There's a lot of interest uh, overall. Um, I'm not I'm not in a great position to say politically because you know a lot of people, it's not necessarily been socialized at really high levels of government, and we're not having those kind of conversations. At the moment, we're really very focused on the identification. And for that, you know, we have lots of technical expertise housed within government where there's a significant amount of interest. And uh, as and I didn't highlight this well enough in one of the slides, but, you know, we have uh, processes that are underway uh, in, you know, that are in each of the regions, uh, and eight of these are underway. And, and in every case, we've got quite a bit of interest from, you know, government entities within that. Great. So this process to identify KBAs has been going on in various parts of Canada for the past year and a half, two years almost. How will, if at all, the publication of the national standard now influence that process? Kira, that might be a better question for you. <laughs> sure, it's, it's a good question too. Um, we anticipated the the development of this national standard right from the beginning, as Justina said, even before I came on to this project. So we've been thinking about it, but there were some parts of it that we couldn't imagine so well. Um, and uh, for example, tools and approaches um, in terms of even workflows for figuring out how do you identify all the the global triggers and the national triggers do you treat them in the same way do you go in a stepwise manner across a region identifying all of them um, some of the some of the products from the kba process will be interesting and will be submitted at the global scale to the global secretariat uh, but then the national kbas are not and so they require different uh, nomination forms for example and we're only getting to the point right now where we can integrate all of that information and all of those approaches into one set of integrated tools uh, so an example is you know the creation of KBA nomination forms, which are, you know, there's a lot of set steps to how to propose and provide evidence for the identification of a key biodiversity area. So one form that can accommodate both 
uh, national and global trigger elements, both species and, and uh, ecosystems. And that's not a, a small thing, trying to figure all that out from the beginning. So we are just getting to a point now after two years where we have all the tools in place. We have a lot of the processes understood. I wouldn't say everything because we're still learning constantly as we go across from region to region. Um, but we're in a fantastic place right now to go kind of full speed ahead. We have some geographic gaps left, uh, for example, in Ontario and in some of the, the prairie provinces uh, where once we start getting that work, we'll be in a good position there to be able to advance even more quickly in those places. Now that we understand the full suite of elements that are the targets of our work and we have the tools to um, assess them. How often will Canadian KBAs be reassessed? Is there a process for identifying those that might need to be reassessed over time? <laughs> I can take that question too, just because that is it's standardized and it is in the key biodiversity guidelines at the global scale. We we are, we do we are adding to the global guidelines to a degree, but we're being very conservative in how we apply both the uh, the global and the national. Uh, standard. We are following the guidelines very specifically. I think it's important to be as consistent as possible across the world and across Canada as well. So um, KBAs are meant to be reassessed every eight to 12 years. Um, and par partially that's because things change so fast in the, the in our understanding of species. Their, their threat status might change um, within that time, their population might change drastically within that time. And due to climate change too, this is one of the ways that we're approaching how to incorporate an understanding that these species are on the move because of climate change. Um, and so the, the sites may need to be delineated, even if the species populations remain somewhat similar and the threat status remains similar, um, those species could be moving in space. So we will, we do plan to flag them at about eight years time and try to reassess and monitor them on a regular basis at that time frame. So you touched on this a little bit in your answer already, Kira, but uh, maybe you want to speak to it a little more. The next question from Liv is, how did you consider the climate change component during the Canadian KBA process? Um, sure, and, and maybe Justina will, yeah. will be able to add to that. Do you want to start? Yeah, maybe I'll start because this was a big um, subject during the during the actual uh, the, the, the four year consultative process that I described at the beginning. Um, and uh, the feeling was that, you know, inserting it as a predictor for example, was uh, was you know it's not a threats based. First of all, you don't bring in threats uh, into the actual identification. Those are not part of the criteria, but they are part of the documentation. Um, the threats themselves. Um, but then also, if you brought in climate at this point um, at the beginning, you you would be you know really potentially subjected to quite a bit of speculation, especially since these are right at the site level. And so that's where it gets much more dicey. So what was decided was that really that is what reassessment, why reassessment is so important as Kira has described, and that that really would be where the subject, uh, where the where climate change would be most dealt with at this at this time. You know, that might evolve in the, in the future. We may find that in the next standard, um, that is going to need some more attention. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, at the present time, that is how how the standard was devised, and it seems to be working for for now. And I'm wondering, with climate change impacting different parts of Canada at different rates, will we be able to incorporate rate of change into the reassessment of different sites? Like, would that change how frequently some sites are reassessed or how we look at data vintage for observations, for example? Well, just I mean, the, my main way to respond to that is this is a this is a difficult process. Doing it the first time is hard enough. Um, it's been it's been useful and instructive to to use this process as a means of, for example, revisiting important bird area designations that were were done a while ago, um, and uh, and 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 it's really useful for for that purpose. So so there's no question that reassessment is important for all sorts of reasons, and that some will be more 
critical to do than others, but you have to be very careful about overpromising that because uh, because uh, you know we have to see how it goes and how quickly we get through this phase, and then what we set up for uh, for being in perpetuity so that um, so that we can do that and also welcome um, nominations from other people, which is envisaged uh, the way the standard is is developed, is to be able to have other people. Um, you know, uh, uh, nominate uh, KBAs that that uh, that that uh, that meet the the criteria, which all of which is going to be available and and with tools and so on. Okay. Uh, Dan asks, what are the most significant information gaps to identify KBAs in Canada, and how do we fill them? Kira, that's one for you. All right, um, that's quite clear to us at this point. For species, uh, there are many species, especially rare species um, and geographically restricted species for which we don't have enough survey effort. So we don't actually know very much about the distribution of many species that appear to be to only exist in Canada so that we have full responsibility for their persistence uh, at the global level. Um, so, so for example, we, we, we require so much data and understanding of the distribution of species to be able to identify a key biodiversity area in the first place that if we know a species from one site locality, for the most part, um, that's not enough to identify a, a key biodiversity area, even if it's possible that that's the only place that that species exists. So we do, um, we certainly can fill those gaps by uh, through further survey effort. And one of the uh, the ancillary products that we hope to um, make public and share on our website is lists of species for which we really do think that there are key biodiversity areas out there, but for which we could not make pro progress uh, due to a lack of data. And we are working with some partners. So, for example, Cypress Hills Provincial Park in Saskatchewan is asking what are the key biodiversity area trigger species in that park so that they can align their, their summer survey season to, to focus on some of those species. So those kinds of partnerships and, and focus on, on, on that, that will help a lot. Uh, for ecosystem criteria, it's a little bit different. It's very hard to um, apply the key biodiversity area ecosystem criteria. So there's a couple there focused on ecosystems. Um, because we don't have a national vegetation classification, um, and so we don't have a, a system of classifications of our ecosystems at, at the correct level to be able to even apply the criteria. So we, we, we do have lots of fantastic ecosystem classifications that are more provincial and territorial. And so we're working with those, but it's, um, it's, diff it's more difficult and complex to try to work out what system we should be using at what level, and there's work to be done there. And then some work that Justina is actually leading on Criterion C, uh, is the other part. We're trying to figure out how to assess ecological integrity and biotic integrity at the at the at the national scale is is a real methodological challenge too. I'll leave it at those three for now. I want to give a bit of a shout out for a, a, a very important report on on all our endemic species that came out about a year ago by Nature Conservancy of Canada, and uh, and that uh, really puts puts out you know which which of these species are at stake that. That where we have so little, um, where where we have such huge responsibility and not necessarily sufficient knowledge, um, and so that that timing of that report was really terrific. Thank you. Art asks, how will overlapping KBAs be uh -huh. handled? <laughs> I would assume that a single entity with multiple subsections would make sense. Oh, that's for you, Kira. I think you deal with that every day, don't you? <laughs> yeah, and and, uh, and Justina, you could easily answer this question too. But but actually, the truth is, we are still experimenting with this. Um, the there are no overlapping KBAs within a within the global set. For example, you're not allowed to have overlapping KBAs. If you have overlapping biodiversity elements, you need to delineate around them and have one integrated KBA. Same thing at the national scale. So the only issue is if there are overlapping national and global KBAs. Um, and, and so what we're struggling with is trying to figure out, you know, how to delineate these sites in the most ecologically defensible way um, in a sort of scientific, consistent, robust manner um, that provides us with sort of sites so that so sites that still meet the KBA description and don't lead to uh, 
mismatching data sets at the global and the national scale. So what we're doing at the moment is that we're not allowing KBAs to overlap at all. And that so we have to integrate information that we have at the national scale and the global scale and develop sites that have um, that incorporate both. We've been discussing this with the global uh, secretariat to how, to how to do this in a way that um, allows them to have their global KBAs that still conform to their expectations and standards, um, but that may be slightly bigger because we're including national uh, trigger elements. And uh, so far we haven't come up with against any issues with that. Um, if we end up having some large overlapping sites that are not acceptable at the global scale and that they don't work at the national scale, then we're going to have to revisit it. And we have a couple of alternate strategies that I think I, I, I won't go into the details too much now, um, but Art, if you're curious about it, I'd be happy to discuss it at any time. OK, uh, this will probably be our last question as we're reaching the hour. Um, James wonders, how is this related to the DFO process of identifying ecologically and biologically significant areas? Yeah, so um, I will say that EPSAs um, were uh, considered, you know, when we, during the, the, the larger four-year process, uh, we brought together all of these various standards uh, or, or pro uh, process methods and so forth for identifying important areas for any element of biodiversity and EPSAs were certainly part of them. And um, interestingly, EPSAs have uh, one criterion that that's that probably one of the only ones that are there's quite similar to criterion C, at least in concept that uh, now, you know, um, that, that uh, these high ecologically integrity areas, although it's called something different. Um, the DFO process had has had, had been going uh, uh, along uh, and and had been working on EPSAs here in, in Canada, the pathway processes for terrestrial. So there has been some division uh, through that uh, that, 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 is, that has occurred whereby most of our attention has been on terrestrial. But we do have a few um, initiatives and some very obvious candidates of marine KBAs um, in various parts of Canada that uh, Kira might want to mention, uh, which, which will help illustrate uh, the, how KBAs can be done in the marine environment. Sure, the, the, there's a couple that people are working on in, in BC. Riley Pollum, our coordinator there, is looking into a couple of sites with DFO involvement for killer whales, for the certain populations of killer whales. In Quebec, our Quebec coordinator um, has identified a site with in collaboration with Parks Canada for Beluga. Um, there's a site in Nova Scotia identified by our coordinator there who um, uh, for, uh, I should know what seal this is, it's on Sable Island. Um, and, and then there are some other sites too. And I think that we would like to work with DFO um, specifically on a couple of the Northern sites uh, for, for example, for Narwhal. And the, the big difference that we see is that this is the scale of the KBAs versus the EPSAs. The EPSAs are usually much larger, larger, and we hope that the KBAs could actually feed into the EPSA process as sort of a smaller elements that might uh, strengthen the EPSA um, uh, sort of work that's going on that, that is uh, already well established. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Riley just wrote into the chat that the Johnston Strait, the Proust Bank and Western Dixon entrance are all KBAs in progress for killer whales, resident killer whales, and a pile of marine bird KBAs are also in the works. Uh, so thank you very thank you. much That's to great. Justina and Kira for jumping in for these questions as well. Thank you everyone who has joined us. Uh, we've recorded this webinar and I'll make that available on the website and post it on Twitter tomorrow. Um, so with that, thank you again, and we'll see you all in about a month. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.